Right, so what we are looking at now is another <coughs> another algorithm or another way of solving IOPs, which can either be used just on its own or combined with branch and bound. So that you can perhaps solve integer linear programs maybe quicker or in a different way. Um, but there's an an important concept of uh, what is a valid inequality. Okay, and I said that a little bit uh, last week as an introduction, but uh, a valid inequality is something that, okay, so what we talked about is you've got your constraints, these and the uh, on negativity, they give, they give you the well, on negativity value that you have to be right in this horizontal line, but a vertical line and up of the horizontal line. And then these three constraints give you like the half planes, which you have to be And if it's, a, if it's just a linear programming problem, then that's it. All the yellow region is the feasible region, so all the physical solutions are just the yellow points. And then it's quite easy because you have the simplex method and the simplex method goes from one corner to another and find the corner uh, quite quickly in practical terms. And, and you've got the optimal solution to your linear problem and problem. Now the complication comes from requiring the solution to be all integer. Because then you, you can't just do uh, you can't just do that. You, have to find the best among the points with integer coordinates. So, so what, how would you do that? Okay, so the branch and bound algorithm somehow was trying to split them into different subcases and then investigate all of those sub, well, two sub problems over time and then go through and then eventually find the best point in there. Whereas this uh, cutting planes algorithm, the idea is different. So the idea is that you can keep adding new constraints that don't kill any of the integer any of the integer points. Okay, so for example, if I add <coughs> this line, Okay, so and I and I say that my constraint will say that I have to be to the left of this line. Uh, so what's that constraint? It's something like so this is uh, zero, one, two, three, four. So this this is saying that x one plus x two is less than or equal to five. I think. That's a constraint which you have some yellow points that don't satisfy it. So there are some points that satisfy all these all of these three, but not that constraint. However, among the integer coordinated or the integer points in there, all of them satisfy that. Okay, so I can safely add this one and it removes, so it cuts off. Uh, some of the yellow points, and now I have fewer of uh, the smaller piece of the region of the LP relaxation. that make sense? Yeah, so that's a, an example of, uh, of what we call a valid inequality. Okay, we could get another one which would go like this, like this. So this is a, so if you want to be on that side, this is a valid inequality which says that x1, take x2, has to be less than or equal to 1. I think the simplex method with this objective would still find this point as the optimal solution to that point. Or something like that. So it wouldn't be integer. Well, depending on the objective, it might find one of these two. Um, but then, if somehow you got smart and added this constraint, 
which is what you want to be on that side. So this constraint says that x1 is less than or equal to 2, I think. <coughs> But if you add these constraints to your linear program, and no matter what the objective is going to be, you always find, simplex method will always find one of the corners as the solution, and it's always going to be uh, integer. So that's good, because then you don't have to do anything. You just, uh, if you know that you can add these constraints, then uh, you're winning, because, yeah. And you can just solve the right Okay, so that's the idea behind this behind this algorithm, really. Um, so like I said, um, an inequality that is satisfied by all the integer feasible solutions of an integer linear programming problem is called a valid inequality. Okay. Um, now the question is just if you don't have the if you don't have the picture if you have many decision variables or something like this uh, how do you come up with such inequalities and how do you come up with good ones so that you can then cut off some of the non-integer points and get some solutions <coughs> so let's have a look at some examples how you can uh, derive valid inequalities just from the algebraic formulation so just from inequalities like this. So for example, in this case, what would happen if you have x2 and x4 both equal to zero? So if you put x2 and x4 to zero, you would have This would be zero, so that would vanish. This would be zero, so that would vanish. So you would get uh, an inequality which says that um, 3x1 plus 2x3 is left, plus x5 is less than or equal to minus 2. Is that possible with zero, one variables? No, it's not possible. So if it's not possible, then this cannot happen, right? You cannot have x2 and x4 both equal to zero. If that is a constraint of your linear, uh, of your integer program, it cannot happen that both x2 and x4 is, uh, is zero, and therefore, at least one of them has to be uh, one and at least one of them has to be one is this linear constraint is it not we've talked about this before so this is a valid inequality Yeah. Okay. Well, we still not, still really don't know how to come up with them, but uh, just to see some examples of uh, of valid inequalities and how you can prove that they are valid. So another example is that if you say x one in the same situation, if x one is one and x two is zero, then so what happens? You have three, x2 is zero, so four x2 minus four x2 vanishes. So three plus two x3 minus three x4 plus x5 is 
is less than or equal to minus two. Or you could say that two x three minus three x four plus x five is less than or equal to minus five. Is this possible? <coughs> yes. How would you make it possible? Yeah. Why not? They're all binary. Yeah. They're all binary. The least number you can get on the left hand side is if the variables with the positive coefficients are zero. <coughs> This is zero and this is zero, and the ones with a negative coefficient are one. So the least number you can ever get on the left hand side is minus three, and that's not less than minus five. So this is also not possible. So if this is not possible, then this is not possible. You can't have x1 equal to 1 and x2 equal to 0. And if you can't have x1 equal to 1 and x2 equal to 0, do you know what linear constraint that is? How do I write it as a linear inequality? No idea. I have an idea. <coughs> x1 is less than or equal to x2. So the only case when with binary variables when this is not satisfied is when x1 is 1 and x2 is 0, otherwise it's satisfied. Okay, so this is exactly what uh, we want. Any questions? Has it been clarified, Marita? Yeah. Was it an interesting question for everybody to ask? No. Nope. Ah, that's a shame. <laughs> Would have been nice to have a question. Okay, then I have to assume that uh, everybody's fine with that. So this is a certain way how you can come up with valid inequalities when you have binary variables. How about when you don't have binary variables? So. This, in this example, all these variables are integer, non-negative, and you're given one of the constraints of the uh, of the linear program or of the ILP. Yes. How do you want to stop trying to make valid inequalities? So what? Yeah, you're getting ahead of what I'm saying a little bit. Uh, it depends on what setting you are in. So we'll get to that. So, so okay, I'll just very quickly uh, can say that if you're solving a specific uh, integer program with a specific objective, and what you do is, and we'll see that later, is you solve DLP relaxation, and when it's not all integers, then you add a new constraint <coughs> and resolve relaxation with the new constraint added and keep doing that until you hit an int all integer solution. Okay, and then you can stop. And you don't know whether you've, you know, that with a different objective you might get a non-integer solution, but perhaps you don't care because you're only interested in this objective. So that's the basic idea. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. But we'll get to that later. Uh, the idea how you add constraints, that is an important example because it shows the main kind of principle of uh, how this is done in general. So in this case, let's have a look at this one and this constraint and divide divide it, divide the constraint. By 11. Why 11? Well, because I tell you so. So what do we get? We get uh, 13 over 11 of x1, 
plus 20 over 11 of x2 plus x3 plus 6 over 11 of x4 is less than or equal to 72 over 11. So this is a valid inequality, right? Any feasible solution to an integer program that contains this constraint also has to satisfy this constraint because it's the exact same constraint, which is divided by 11. So we're not using anything really about this uh, specifically. So that's a valid inequality. Okay? Hopefully you agree. Now, what I can do is take advantage of all these variables being non negative. <coughs> so if, if instead of uh, 13 over 11 of x1, I just take x1, I'm going to make this left hand side even smaller. Okay, and if I, if instead of uh, 20 over 11 of x2, I'm going to take just x2, that's also going to make this left hand side smaller. And if uh, instead of 6 over 11 of x4, I'm going to remove it completely, that's going to make this expression smaller. Okay. So what I can do is just take uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3, and that is certainly going to be less than or equal to 72 over 11. That's an important step. Is that clear? If you say no, then uh, it's not clear to anybody told you. <laughs> so 13 over 11 is larger than 1. Okay. This is positive, non negative. So if I take less of something non negative than 13 over 11, then I get something that's smaller than what I had before. And <coughs> Similarly here, this is less than, sorry, this is uh, more than one. So if I take just one of x2, I get some, I get less than I have before. Uh, x3, I take all of x3. Here, instead of something that's not negative, I'm taking zero, so I get less than I had before. How much did I have before? Well, I don't know, but it was less than 72 over 11. Now I have even less, so I still have less than 72 over 11. Yes. Why did you divide that number? I did, divided by 11 as an example. So I wanted to divide it by something that will, that will give me non-integer coefficients, so I can run them now. Okay, so what I've done is, I'm just looking at these non-integer coefficients, and I take the nearest lower number that is integer. And so this is between 1 and 2, so I'm taking 1. This is between 1 and 2, so I'm taking 1. This is between 0 and 1, so I'm taking 0. Um, so that's why. I could have divided it by 7 if you wanted to. But it would give me a different inequality, but it would be the same principle. Just uh, 11 doesn't make much difference. Okay, so this is uh, valid. And it's valid because um, all these things, so x1, x2, and x4, are greater than or equal to 0. So if I decrease the coefficient, the product with the non-negative mm -hmm. thing is also going to decrease. Now, what's 72 over 11? More than 6, but less than 7. This is less than 7. So, can x1 plus x2 plus x3 be more than 6? Like, would it be 6.5?
How can x1 plus x2 plus x3 be 6 and a half? They're all integer. So you can't get something fractional. If you add three integers, you get an integer. And you get an integer which is less than 7. And because it's less than 7, it can't be more than 6. So, like this, we get that if I add x1 plus x2 plus x3, it's going to be less than or equal to 6. Because x1, x2, x3 are integers, and when, when I add them together, Okay, what I get is less than or equal to 72 over 11, which is less than 7. An integer less than 7 can't be more than 6. Okay, so there are two crucial things about this. The first one is, <coughs> when I have non-negative decision variables, I can round down the coefficients, and I'm getting something that's less than what I had before. So, you know, so going from this inequality to that inequality is a, is a valid step. And the second thing is, when I have a non, when I have a, an integer left-hand side and a non-integer right-hand side, I can round down the right uh, I get a valid input. Okay? Yes. If the x2 coefficient is 22, would you still round down to 1 x2? Well, if the x2 coefficient uh, was 22, you would get 2 x2. So you couldn't do it. round down to 2 whatever. Down. You round down, but 2 rounded yeah. down is still 2. Yeah, okay. Just like here, the coefficient here is 1, so I can't take 0. Well, I could do, I mean, I could do. It wouldn't spoil anything, but it would be uh, less useful in equality. So, like if I remove x3 from here, that is still valid as well. But without the x3, it's less useful. If it's like this, I know that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is no more than 6. Which, and, But then I also know that x1 plus x2 is like not equal to 6 because x3 is. So this is like stronger than what I would get if I land it. I wouldn't get anything false, I would just get something that's weaker. Okay? Now, how does one get this kind of divide by 11 or not divide by 11? That's a very good question. And we don't know yet. And we still don't know. Uh, so what I want to do here is uh, just times this by 2 over 7, and the second inequality by 37 <coughs> over 63, and this by 0. How am I getting these numbers? Well, that's secret for now. But I'll reveal that secret very soon. So what am I getting like this? The first inequality is giving me 2x1 minus 4 over 7x2 is less than or equal to 4, is that right? Whereas the second says that uh, 
um, what, 37 over 63 x2 is less than or equal to Thirty-seven over twenty-one, I think. Yeah. Now, what happens when I add them together? <coughs> I get two x one plus one over sixty-three x two is less than or equal to. 121 divided by 21. So what do I get from that? By the same method, to round it down stays two. This little small thing rounded down is zero, and this, what's this? It's less than six. Because six would be 126 over 21, so this is no more than five. So rounding down, I get five. So in this, in the same way as before, I get that two x one is less than or equal to 5. <coughs> Can I do something smart here? Divide by 2? Can I round down anything? Yes, so therefore X1 is less than or equal to 2 is, is a valid inequality. Where do I get the nasty numbers from? I can't remember. They were. <laughs> Somehow. So if you, if you recall, that was the first example that we started with. And x1 is less than or equal to 2 was one of the red lines that we had in there. And this shows that it is possible to go from just the formulation, just the constraint we had, to that inequality using that one trick with rounding down coefficients take a suitable uh, linear combination. Okay, so the, the whole <coughs> Okay, go back. What was the exact question? I think everybody's interested. I mean, like, there will be more people who have the same question. Yeah, yeah. 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 So like the trick we saw on the previous screen was that when you have a linear inequality like this and all the decision variables are non-negative and integer, and you can round down all the coefficients and 1 over 63 rounds down to 0 and 121 over 21 rounds down to 1. And you get something that is valid, that satisfied by all the integer x1s and x2s. They're also satisfied. Okay, so that's the general idea of uh, how you're getting how you're getting valid inequalities is you take some linear combination of what you have already. Um, how how you get the coefficients, I still haven't told you. Um, and then round down these coefficients, round down the right hand side, right hand side and you get an inequality, and it's called a flat hole bundle inequality. D is called flat hole, and G is called bundle. 
Okay, so that's the basic idea. Uh, is everybody fine with the basic idea, or do I need to do I need to go back to? Yeah, all good. Excellent. What's next? Yeah, this. Oh no, this is somewhere where the handout tab stopped. This is not so well. <coughs> Like a, there was a theorem by Schreiber, just uh, wrote the book. Um, he proved that actually any valid inequality that you have, you can get in using that same procedure. The only thing is you don't know what numbers to times the inequalities with to get the right one, or what is the best way to do it. But. Uh, but if you knew that, then any value inequality you want, you could get from uh, well, using that same procedure that we've just seen. So, so there is like a gummery way of getting these things. And it's done from the simplex tableau, so it's quite exciting. So when you have the, the same problem that we started with, with stack variables, you get this initial stack well, you don't have to copy that, put that online to so just listen. Um, so this is the first, so kind of when we were doing um, branch and bound, the first step would always have been to solve the LP relaxation. So this is the first simple stack well for the LP relaxation, and then you go and pivot and pivot and pivot. And you find that um, the final tableau looks like this. Okay, so the relaxed solution has x2 is an integer, but x1 is not. So you would have to branch on x1. But now instead of branching, we're going to do something else. Because what we're going to do is uh, look at the x1 row. So what does the x1 row mean? <coughs> every, every row in a simplex tableau is there because of a linear equation, right? So this, this row means that if you take x1 plus 1 over 7 s1 plus 2 over 7 s2 uh, you always get 27 does that ring a bell turn one we're doing a lot of things like that okay now, therefore, x1 plus 1 over 7 s1 plus 2 over 7 s2, well, it's equal to 20 over 7. Well, when something is equal to 20 over 7, it's also less than or equal to 20 over 7, isn't it? So this is a valid inequality. Can we do the rounding trick? Are you sure? Yes. Uh, that's all we need to do. Ah. Yes, but why can you do the rounding trick? You remember there were two conditions that it was relying on, and they were that all these variables there are non negative, number one, which we have because x1 is non negative, and the slack variables are also non negative. Number two was that all these variables had to be integers, otherwise you couldn't. Ah, 
purpose. So, so this is relying on something. And you see that because this is an integer, x1 and x2 have to be integer, and the right hand side is also integer, and the slack bar is also <coughs> integer, because there's no way to play. You get an integer, and you have to add something to it to get 14, well, that's something that's to be integer. And x2 has to be right there, 3 minus x2. 3 is integer, x2 is integer, so x2 is also integer. And same for s3. But you have to be careful here because if you don't have integral right hand side, then these slack variables need not be integer, and in that case, you couldn't do the trick. But in our example, they are. So, therefore, as George said, x1 is less than or equal to 2 is valid, and it's because. X1, S1, S2 are non negative, and X1, S1, S2 are all integers. Yes. You know, because you said obviously if it's equal, it's less than. Yes. The is great. You could do, yeah. So, what, what, why did you decide what to decide? Just trying to see how it's going to Well, you can't. No. <laughs> so, So like you can't, so you, you have to you have to round them up. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So um, right, let's have a look. So you can also say, of course, that x one uh, plus one over seven s one. Plus two over seven. I don't know what we're going to get. Uh, two over seven s two is greater than or equal to uh, twenty over seven. Okay. Well, that is true. Now, if you want to preserve now, what first step here was you replace each of them with something smaller, and you get something that's still less than twenty over seven. Now you want to replace each of them by something at least as large, and you get something that's still greater than or equal to 20 or so. Okay, so what you would get is, so this implies that if you take x1 plus s1 plus s2, that's still going to be greater than or equal to 20 over 7. So this implies that x1 plus S1 plus S2 is greater than or equal to 3. So you would get another one. Um, but that's not what the algorithm tells you to do, really. Why not? I don't know. I'll, I'll have a look at it, <laughs> whether it's useful or not. Might not be as useful. Not not sure at the moment, but like you can get something else, but I don't think it's as useful. And at the moment, I don't know why. But uh, the idea in the algorithm, anyway, that we're looking at is that you want. The decision variables to be less than or equal to the right hand side. It's actually equal, but you want it to be less than. 
You can round up and I'm not sure what that is. Might be also useful. <coughs> Ah, so what, what you could do instead of, uh, okay, so the, the main point was we took a, a row which has a non-integer vowel. Okay, because if we took one with an integer vowel, then there would be nothing to, to do. Because if you round down three, then you still have three, so it won't get you anything new. Uh, the interesting thing about when you pick, well, you could have picked this one as well. And you can do it as an exercise if you want. The interesting thing about this is that when you take one that has a non-integer uh, vowel, what happens is that the values of inequality you get is not going to be satisfied by this solution. Okay, so here you get x1 is less than or equal to 2, and here you have x1 which is larger than 2. So there's actually so what happens is that from either of these two rows, you would get an inequality that kills that optimal solution. Kind of an important, an important thing about it. So what happens is what we did normally with those was, what does that say? Okay, so we had x1 is less than or equal to 2. So normally when you're adding a constraint, you get, you Kind of do it like this, right? So one, zero, does anybody still remember adding a constraint to uh, simplex tableau? So this would be how you do it. Now that's not a simplex tableau because you have a basic x1, which is uh, one where it's not supposed to be but then a row reduction gives you the actual new simplex tableau. So when you do this, so you subtract what x1 row from the s4 row, and you should be getting minus 6 over 7, 0, 0, minus 1 over 7, minus 2 over 7, 0, and 1. So if you were really trying to solve it using this algorithm, this is what you do, or what the solver would do as well. Add a new constraint like this, then you get an infeasible tableau, so you have to do a dual pivot. If you do the dual pivot, you get a new tableau, and if you're lucky, then your solution is going to be all integer, and if you're not lucky, then you will find another row which has a non-integer vowel, and use it to create a new um, constraint, add that constraint. That's how this algorithm works. Do I have anything else here? So after you actually do the dual pivot in this case, you've got lucky, you get x1 is 2, x2 is 3, and uh, the objective is 9, and that's the optimal solution, so this was quite handy to me. I think that's uh, So that's the algorithm, as I've just described it. Solve the relaxation. If it's integer, problem is solved. If not, then you choose one of the rows. How you choose the right one, you don't know. There's no way of knowing. Or you pick one of the ones which has a fractional value in the bar column. Use that one by rounding down to get the new cut. Add it to the new tableau. <laughs> and when you've got a feasible tableau, then if everything is integer, you've found your solution, and if not, then you keep repeating this, and that's not right. Yeah? Any questions? <coughs> so now you know how to do question two on the assignment, because it Tells you to <coughs> use a row and find a valid inequality.
Thank <laughs> you. 